Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thank you for tuning in, everyone. And my apologies to my listeners. Just coming uh, back from a, a, a terrible bout with laryngitis. I hope my voice will hold out this morning. But we'll continue where we left off Thursday in this little book entitled The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. Thursday, our discussion centered around preterism, where we discovered the very genesis of the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy, that heresy that Paul named that of Hymenaeus and Philetus. They were the ones who did not rightly divide the word of truth, but came to the conclusion Christ had already returned spiritually and that we were now in the church age. Resurrection had already taken place, and we were now in the church age. They did not interpret the scripture literally. They interpreted it spiritually and came to a false conclusion. They did not rightly divide the word of truth. Dividing the word of truth correctly or rightly has to do with timing. And if you don't divide the word of truth correctly, you're going to get things out of order. Okay? A careful reading of Scripture makes sure that this doesn't happen. But Hymenaeus and Philetus came to an erroneous conclusion, and based on the assumption that Christ had already returned, that the resurrection had already taken place, meant that the church was already in the kingdom age. Okay, Now, this heresy spread and was picked up and promulgated by the Church of Alexandria in Egypt. And many of the so-called holy fathers of the Roman Catholic Church were of this belief, namely Origen and others. And it is the very basis, very foundational basis for the existence of the papacy who claims that he is king of kings and lord of lords on the earth, that we are in the kingdom age, and that Christ's vicar on earth is the papacy. And the papacy is to rule the world as Christ until Christ returns, or simply replace Christ. Okay, we're now in the kingdom age. So you can find the genesis of the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy as being the foundation of the Roman Catholic Church all the way back to the heresy of Hymenaeus and Philetus. And they simply came to this error by concluding that the return of Jesus Christ was not physical, but spiritual. And that the kingdom age would commence with Christ's spiritual return, either in 33 A.D., or 70 A.D., or no later than 410 A.D. at the fall of the Roman Empire. This means that when the empire fell, when the Roman Empire fell, and that which replaced it, Holy Roman Empire, under the Pope, that establishes the Pope as the vicar of Christ, the, 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 the king of kings and lord of lords during the quote-unquote Christian era or the millennium, the thousand years reign of Christ. And the person of Christ is the Pope. Okay, this is all rooted in error, lock, stock, and barrel error from not rightly dividing the word of truth. The Bible spells out the correct order of things. And if we read it and rightly divide it, put things in their proper order, we come to a complete different conclusion that Christ is literally going to return. Okay? Now, has he literally returned? Has history recorded his literal return? No. It's yet future. But the papacy saying otherwise has put itself, has elevated itself the position of Christ on earth, and he has dominated throughout the entire Christian era. And this is what the book of Revelation reveals to us. 
The book of Revelation encompasses the entire history of the church from its beginning until the return of Christ. And that same period of time, the world is dominated by the papacy. Okay? This is how we rightly divide the word of truth. Now, we're going to review a little bit this morning because of the long weekend and because of my illness and absence. We're going to discuss Preterism's progressive course. Now, we all understand that error gets error. If one does not rightly divide the word of truth and comes to an erroneous conclusion or puts things in, the, in an improper order, then that causes uh, us to uh, uh, put other things in improper order. So error leads to even more error. And the author is going to outline, outline some of those errors. First, that Christ returns spiritually either at Pentecost or at 70 A.D. at the destruction of Jerusalem. Therefore, we must now be in the kingdom. And the church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, is that kingdom of Christ. Okay, there's the very foundation for the papacy. Erroneous as it is, it's a result of Hymenaeus and Philetus' Uh, wrongly dividing the word of truth, getting things out of order. And because that error spread and was propagated by one of the most famous religious institutions in the world, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, college at Alexandria, the theological college in Alexandria, we have the basis for the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy and the existence of the papacy. It assumes that Christ has already returned, the resurrection has already taken place, and now Christ rules and reigns on the earth in the, per in the person of the papacy, and that the Roman Catholic Church is the kingdom. All right, the second, the promises made to Israel in the Old Testament, they are assumed to have been fulfilled in a spiritual nature, therefore they find their fulfillment in the church. Okay, so when God promises the kingdom to Israel in the Old Testament, they believe that that fulfillment is found in the Roman Catholic Church. That, too, is spiritually interpreted. See what happens when you get things out of order? Christ has not yet returned. But now they're taking all these other passages that seem to... Uh, to, to speak about a literal kingdom, not a spiritual one, a literal kingdom of Christ, they now attribute that to the Roman Catholic Church, a fulfillment of it. This is the great error when we fail to rightly divide the word of truth and get things out of order. This false interpretation, this spiritualization of the Scripture has resulted in the Roman Catholic Church, and error begets error. And here's another error, that the millennium has arrived, therefore we are now ruling and reigning with Christ. And that Christ is the papacy. Okay? That's how the Roman Catholic Church sees it. This error of Hymenaeus and Philetus has resulted in the Roman Catholic Church. Its foundational basis is preterism. The idea that Antichrist is taken out of the way, no more a factor. Christ has returned spiritually, the Pope. The resurrection has taken place, and now the kingdom is to be ruled over by the papacy. The papacy alone is king of kings and lord of lords, and has stated as such the entire church age. This is how error begets error. This is what happens when we wrongly divide the word of truth. <clears throat> now, these errors have resulted in certain events that have taken place throughout the world. And one of those events is that Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity and declared Christianity to be the state religion. Okay. This is what happened early in the Roman Catholic Church. 
because of the the preterist belief, Emperor Constantine took the advantage of this popular belief and literally adopted Christianity so that he could be the king of it. So then we had a union of church and state. Constantine being the, 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 the Roman emperor took charge of by adopting Christianity, he took charge of the church. He became a pope in the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? This led to even further error. The church and state married, and as time passed, the church... Now, we have to call... The, you have to understand that when it's talking about the church, it's talking about the state church. The state and the church united. And after this marriage took place, the church, that is the Roman Catholic Church, assumed more power and more power and more and more wealth. Okay? It grew into a monster. All right? This state church began teaching the foregoing spiritual interpretation as truth. Now, naturally, you would assume that having derived their very basis of existence and justification in the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy, having gotten the Bible out of its proper order, in order for them to continue to justify their claims as the King of kings and the Lord of lords over this quote-unquote Christian kingdom, they had to insist on this interpretation of Bible prophecy, the preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy. And because they believed it and they taught it, it was their duty to teach these precepts to all nations and then to stamp out all error and unbelief wherever it was found. Okay, If anyone questioned the authority of Constantine as head of the Christian church, he was both an enemy of the church and an enemy of the state. And they used the power of the state to destroy these people wherever they were found. Okay, this is the early persecution of the saints of Almighty God. It began at the very beginning of the Roman Catholic Church. And the persecution that the Roman Catholic Church leveled upon God's people was more brutal, more ruthless, and extended in, period, in a period of time up until the very presence of and we have a promise from the Scripture, and we'll get to that as we continue our study, that this persecution of the saints will continue until Christ's literal return. When things evolve into their proper order, and all of a sudden the world becomes aware that Christ is literally returning and did not return in 33 A.D. or 70 A.D. or 410 A.D., that the resurrection did not take place. We were never in the kingdom age because Christ himself was not here to rule and reign. And this imposter that has placed himself in Christ's throne for the last 2,000 years will be found to be a fraud. And then all those who this papacy, this state church monster has persecuted and slain throughout the entire Christian age will be destroyed, and Christ will return in vengeance to avenge the saints of Almighty God at the hand of the papacy. All right? This state church began teaching and the foregoing spiritual interpretation, in other words, the preterist interpretation as truth, and they believed then that it was their duty their God-given duty to teach these precepts to all nations and to stamp out all error and unbelief wherever found. In other words, if you didn't believe in the preterist interpretation, if you said that there is no vicar of Christ on the earth, that Christ is the rightful uh, bearer of the throne, and he has not yet returned, then you were burned at the stake. If you didn't acknowledge the papacy as the very replacement of the Son of God on earth with legitimacy to rule over the kings 
of the earth and the uh, and through them the people of the earth you were a heretic and you were a danger to the church and the state and you were slaughtered tortured your property was confiscated your children were taken from you you were separated from your wife and you were forced to either recant or you were killed now does history make more sense now, he said, any knowledgeable Christian, that is one who reads and rightly divides the word of truth, realizes we're not in the kingdom age. Christ has not returned. The Pope is a fraud. Constantine was a fraud. The church-state system is a fraud, a satanic fraud, an antichrist fraud, the papacy has literally been, all throughout the Christian era, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the persecutor of the saints, a false Christ. He's neither a king nor a priest. He is nothing but, as Martin Luther said, a mask for Satan himself. Any knowledgeable Christian who reads and rightly divides the word of truth, gets things in their proper order, understands that we're not in the kingdom age. We're in the age of the papacy, the Antichrist, who will tempt and test and persecute and kill God's people until Christ's literal return. Now, we at once recognize these progressive steps as the history of the Roman Catholic Church. The synagogue of Satan. It rose immediately after the fall of the Roman Empire. It called itself the Holy Roman Empire. It destroyed three kings, the, 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 the Gothic kings, the three little horns of Daniel, and persecuted the saints thought to change God's times and laws, he has fulfilled all these prophecies and all throughout the Christian era. This is the only interpretation that makes sense. It's the only interpretation that jibes with Scripture and with history. It's the historicist interpretation. And it is a minority interpretation in the world today. What is believed in the world today are preterism and futurism. And we cannot possibly know the truth or rightly divide the word of truth until we return to the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy. Any knowledgeable Christian would be historicist in his interpretation, neither preterist nor futurist, but historicists. And we historicists immediately recognize all of these errors and all of these events as being the formative step steps to the creation and the entire history of the Roman Catholic Church. It is rightly, more correctly described as the synagogue of Satan himself. The Antichrist Church, headed up by the man of sin himself, the papacy. Now, an in-depth look at church and secular history will reveal inevitably that any church group or organization that follows these progressive steps and erroneous precepts will eventually terminate into a state and world church. While all Christians earnestly yearn for God's kingdom to rule the earth, knowledgeable Christians recognize until the king returns and those who will rule with him are made corruptible, there cannot be, there can po not possibly be any righteous ruling or reigning. And I, I gave the example that I gave to my doctor <clears throat> some time ago about a year ago now, I believe it was, even the, though he was not allowed to talk religion or politics, 
while he was wearing his medical doctor's frock, I just plainly told him, you know what the Bible says. The Bible says there's none righteous, no, not one. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And he acknowledged by nodding his head. And I said, then what is that government in Washington, D.C., but a government of sinful, wicked, fallen men, whether Democratic or Republican? There's no righteousness in them. They cannot produce righteousness because they are corrupt. And until they are made incorruptible, they are not qualified to rule. They're standing in Christ's place, and they're doing a very poor job of it. They're doing what we might expect from other sinful, wicked, fallen men. And they've made us all slaves. Thinking that they rule in Christ's stead. That they have a divine right to rule. And Christ has not returned yet. This is what the author is teaching here. And he's absolutely correct. We can never expect righteous ruling and reigning in this so-called kingdom age with the Pope as the head, of, the head of the church and the state. Through our politicians, the man of sin literally rules and reigns over us. Our legislators in Washington, D.C., our state legislators in our individual states are forced to make laws commensurate with Roman Catholic canon law. And that's why there's no justice in this country. And we'll not see justice until the rule of the corruptible is replaced with the rule of the incorruptible. And that only takes place after the, after the resurrection. You see what happens when you put the resurrection and the return of Christ in its improper place? You give godly authority and godly power and godly sanction to the most corrupt system the world has ever seen. The most corrupt and the most violent system the world has ever seen. And we're living in it. And we will live in it till we die. And we are to resist it, not with swords of iron, but with the Word of God, the infallible Word of God. And we have to, those of us who rightly divide the Word of truth, must set the record straight. The kingdom of Christ has not returned because Christ Himself has not returned. And we must condemn this ungodly system, this global union of the Roman Catholic Church and the state the global union of church and state that was founded by Constantine under a preterist theology. Now the author continues, and this is where we concluded last Thursday. He says, It is of interest that the early church had one sword, the sword of the Spirit, and did very well. In less than 300 years, by prayer, preaching, teaching, and witnessing, they had won so much of the world's population to Christ, from the slave to the peasant, and even those to the emperor's own household, that the pagan state wanted to join them. Unfortunately, the state churches, by whatever name, attempted to use two swords, the sword of the Spirit plus the sword of the magistrate, the state. History would seem to indicate that this combination is not nearly as effective spiritually as those who use but one sword, the sword of the Spirit. And that's the sword that we wield here at Inquisition Update, and we'll wield it more when we get back in the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month, and you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25, or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773 and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time... Kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty, to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this program and keep it on the air, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. And if you would like to email me with questions or comments, my email address is tom at seawaves.us. That's tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s. Just like the waves of the sea... And then also the uh, website is inquisitionupdate.org. Now, does everyone see the preterist foundation of the Roman Catholic Church? It has literally caused the world to worship and obey the false Christ, the Antichrist. Yes, Christians preach Jesus and him crucified, but they worship and obey the Pope. The laws of the land are made to conform us to Roman Catholic canon law. And every Christian will tell you, God's law is dead. Just ask them. Go up and down the street. What about the Ten Commandments? What about the commandments of God? Oh, they're dead. They're crucified with Christ. That's right. <clears throat> what about the Lord's feast days? Well, they were for the Jews. We celebrate Christmas and Easter And yet not, there's not one single commandment in all the Word of God about Christmas or Easter except to condemn it. Jeremiah chapter 10 condemns Christmas. Acts chapter 8 or 12, if my memory serves me correctly, condemns Easter. These are uniquely pagan, Babylonian celebrations. And they are made the law of the land by Roman Catholic canon law. And this country obeys Roman Catholic canon law. Okay. We'll get into that subject more as the holiday season returns. I hate to talk about it all the time because nobody listens. We're stuck in our pagan Babylonian ways. And even... The, the veneration of Sunday is Babylonian in, in its origin. Not one single word in the, all the Bible about any veneration of the first day of the week. But you will be assailed as a heretic, no matter by anyone who calls himself a Christian, if you assert that the Lord's day is the seventh day. 
the seventh day of the week. And if you observe the seventh day of the week, you'll be regarded as a heretic and an enemy of Christ and an enemy of the church and an enemy of the state. You'll be called a heretic and a cultist and every other derogatory term. And no wonder, it says in the Bible, if anyone lives godly in Christ Jesus, he shall suffer persecution. Do Christians, as a rule, suffer persecution in this country? Not like the saints suffered persecution, that's for certain. Now, continuing with the book, it says, Christ's second coming and unfulfilled prophecies. Okay? We're going to learn the truth now. What does the Bible say? That word of truth that we rightly divide. What does it say? Let's put things in their proper order. Neither the preterist order, which is a Roman Catholic order, nor the futurist order, which is Roman Catholic, but historicist, historical order, prophetic order, rightly dividing the word of truth and history. Because history simply is the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Okay? They go together. If the Bible and history don't jibe, then we know history has been falsified. And if history is not taught, then we cannot see when Bible prophecy was fulfilled. Rome has had a direct hand in both distorting history and, and rewriting history and not teaching history at all. But Protestant historians have recorded certain, the fulfillment of certain prophecies throughout the Christian era, proving that the preterist belief is wrong and that the futurist belief is wrong. Now we're going to hear what God has to say. We're going to put things in their proper order. We're going to rightly divide the word of truth. And we're going to see, just as we saw that preterism is false, we're going to see that historicism is correct. The author says, a significant error and the scriptural responses to that error are found below. Still talking about preterism here. He says, some preterists believe that although Christ did come at Pentecost in 33 A.D. and again in 70 A.D., he will make a final appearance at the end of the world. Others strongly maintain that his second appearance was a spiritual one in 70 A.D., and that is the end of it. So the author is pointing out that even the preterists are bickering and fighting among themselves. When was the prophecy fulfilled? <clears throat> so you, you don't find peace and harmony and unity among the preterists. They fight like cats and dogs among themselves because they all entertain lies. Okay? Now please note, the author says, that the following scriptures are very clear and not limited to one or two obscure verses that might easily be interpreted as one wish. The authors are of the highest caliber who were honest, godly men filled with the Holy Spirit. Their names are Luke, John, and Paul. Please read carefully and prayerfully what they said. In Acts chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it is written, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Okay? We are seeing and reading right here with our own eyes the historical account of the ascension of Jesus Christ, the bodily ascension of Jesus Christ into heaven. And it was witnessed by the apostles. 
visually witnessed by the apostles. No mistake, no spiritualization, no parsing of words. They literally saw Christ ascend into heaven and was received out of their sight by a cloud. And the angels told them, plainly so that anyone could understand, this same Jesus who was taken up from you will return in like manner as you have seen him go. Now, has history ever recorded such a thing? No, not till today, not till tomorrow, and not until Christ comes whenever that is. But it's going to be a literal, physical return of Christ from heaven to the earth just like it was 2,000 years ago when he ascended from the earth to heaven. And until history records that event, no one can say with any credibility that Christ has returned. Now, what did Hymenaeus and Philetus say? That Christ had returned spiritually and that we have been resurrected. The resurrection is past. And we're now in the kingdom of age, the kingdom age, and we have to. Since Jesus isn't visibly present, we have to pick one. We have to pick a king to reign in his stead. And so Emperor Constantine stands up. I'll be the king of the Christian Empire. I'm going to adopt Christianity, and I'm going to unite church and state. I'm going to be the church, and I'm going to be the state in one person. And if anybody defies my authority, I'm going to lop off their heads. And, of course, Emperor Constantine had to share his power with the priests of the Roman Catholic Church. They were his priests. So we had a hermetic union of church and state, simply because we got things out of order, didn't we? But Christ has not literally returned, as the angel said. Just as you've seen this Jesus taken up from you, he will return in like manner as you have seen him go. No spiritualization. Literal return of Jesus Christ. Visible return of Jesus Christ. Nobody will be able to counterfeit it. Nobody will ever be able to deceive us again once Christ descends. And we'll all know that this vicar of Christ, this self-styled, King of kings and Lord of lords in Rome has been a fraud from the get-go that we should never have paid him any heed. We should never acknowledge, have acknowledged him as anything in this world. We should never have been subject to his laws. We should never have allowed him to change God's times and laws. We should have rebelled against him the whole time as we were to rebel against Antichrist himself, a false Christ. That's what he is. And to the degree that the church, this man of sin in Rome, has been a, a, a lord over the state, we should have rebelled against the state and upheld the truth. But we've never done it. We have another historical account this found also in the infallible historical record. This is Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Quote, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Unquote. That sounds spiritual to you? No. It's a physical, visible return of our great God and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. You can't spiritualize such obvious language. Yet, Hymenaeus and Philetus spiritualized it. And they propagated that error. It was taught in one of the most prestigious universities in the world at that time, Alexandria. And the great Roman Catholic fathers were preterist in their interpretation. And out of it came the Roman Catholic Church a union of church and state, one who has persecuted the saints throughout the Christian era. We have another historical account. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 through 18, quote, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, 
rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, getting things in their proper order. He continues, he says, but shun profane and vain babblings. What are profane and vain babblings? Those who get God's prophecies out of order. Those who wrongly divide the word of truth. And when they promote their preterist view that Christ returns spiritually, that the resurrection had already taken place, that we were already in the kingdom age, that we needed a king of kings and lord of lords to rule in Christ's stead, those are profane and vain babblings. Okay? Listen how he describes them. He says, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and out and overthrow the faith of some. Okay? Hymenaeus and Philetus started this heresy that Christ had already returned spiritually, that we were now in the kingdom age, and that we needed a king of kings and a lord of lords, that Christ had spiritually returned and is physically manifest in the papacy. Now, what does a canker do? A canker eats healthy flesh. You ever had a canker sore? You know what would happen if that canker sore engulfed your whole body? What would it look like? Like the world today. Like the world today. As ruled over by the papacy. Paul's prophecies come to pass. Their word, that is the word of Hymenaeus and Philetus, will eat like a canker. There's no cure for it. You simply have to live out the pain of a canker sore. He says of Phineas and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Anybody who believes that the papacy is the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, and is anything but a doddering old pedophile that should be locked up in prison and cast into the ash bin of history, has had their faith overthrown. Because if he's not what I say he is, then he must be viewed as the legitimate replacement of Christ on earth. To me, that's the difference between those who know the truth and those who are woefully deceived. All right, the author continues. He says, Paul wrote these words to Timothy in late 67 A.D. or early 68 A.D. For those who believe that Christ returned at Pentecost, approximately 33 A.D., and thus that the resurrection has already occurred, Paul has laid their claims to rest. Okay? Paul has li literally laid all of these claims to rest by these passages that we've just read. These passages describe nothing less than a visible, physical, observable, historically recorded return of Jesus Christ, and that prophecy has not yet been fulfilled. So there you have it. Any error that has crept or ascended out of this error by Hymenaeus and Philetus to the degree that it has deceived the whole world, it is error for not rightly dividing the word of truth and getting the order out of order. And to the degree that the world believes it, the papacy rules over this earth. That's how widespread this belief is. All right? But Paul puts them all to rest. Paul shows us the root of this preterist error. Paul exposes it. 
because it was evident at Paul's time. Immediately, Satan's minions crept into the church and perverted the truth and led the whole world astray. Paul saw it take place during his lifetime. And look to the monster that that error has grown into today. It dominates the whole world. He says, for those who believe that Christ secretly returned in 70 A.D., see Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 through 6 at the end of these passages. And it's right here in the book. We'll get to it as we go. But first, there's the record of John chapter 14 and verse 3. Quote, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Are we going to spiritualize that one too? Or is that a literal account? That's a literal prophecy. Jesus was taken from us. He ascended into heaven, and he said, I must go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter might, will not come. But if I go away, I will return and receive you unto myself. And this is it. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Are you there now? Or are you still in the stinking canker we call a world? Prophecy yet to be fulfilled, isn't it? What if we get the cart before the horse like the, the preterists did, like Hymenaeus and Philetus? Are we going to say that this is all there is? This is the kingdom? This is the place that God was preparing for us? It doesn't look a dang bit different than the mess he supposedly got us out of. See what errors would revolve from believing that we are already in that place that Christ prepared for us? Now, 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. Now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. You know, the Scripture says no one has ever looked upon God and lived. Even Moses was prevented from seeing God's face. And yet, when he came down off the mountain, they said he glowed, his face glowed like the sun. You cannot look upon the holiness of God without being consumed no man has seen God at any time. You could just easily look into the sun without being scorched, but you cannot look upon God himself in all of his glory. You would be consumed as by a fire. Now, who has looked at God? The Pope? He's still in his sinful, wicked flesh. He would have been consumed by fire if he'd ever seen God much less call himself the vicar of God on earth. Paul says we are now the sons of God, but we've not been glorified yet. That doesn't come until the resurrection. And if during the resurrection we are not changed from our physical, mortal, sinful, Paul called it vile bodies, and to be fashioned unto his glorious body, in other words, to have the same glory as our returning Savior, we would not be able to behold him without being consumed. Now, I have to ask anybody the question, are you still in your flesh? Your flesh? Pinch yourself, does it hurt? Prick your skin, does it bleed? Then Christ has not yet returned. Because if Christ has returned, you would instantaneously be in a glorified body, else you would not be able to behold his glory without being consumed. Yet Paul says, we are now the sons of God. He said, beloved, now are we the sons of God. But it doth not yet appear what we shall be at the resurrection, he would have asked. But we know that when he shall appear, and we are resurrected, this, this mortal becomes immortal, 
this corruptible becomes incorruptible, he says, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In other words, we shall see him in all of his glory. And we will be like him. However he appears, we will be like him because we will be able to behold his face and live to tell about it. Has that occurred? Has history uh, uh, recorded this event? No. So how can we say that that the papacy is the replacement of Christ on the earth? The vicar of Christ He's no replacement of anybody but Satan himself. There's no light in him. He speaks not according to this word, the law and the prophets. He's a sinner, chief of sinners, sinner of sinners, blasphemer of blasphemers. And yet the whole world bows and obeys him. The Congress of the United States welcomes him with red carpets. The presidents of the United States welcome him at the airport. And you're not allowed to speak a word against him in his presence. But I can look the papacy right in the face. I don't see any brightness. I don't see any glory. I see the man of sin, the son of perdition, the one who will be consumed by the spirit of Christ's mouth and by the brightness of his coming. In other words, he will remain in his flesh when Christ returns, and he will be consumed. Just as Moses would have been consumed had he looked directly at God's glory. But I won't be consumed. Because in an instant, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, I'll be changed to be like unto his glorious body. Even though now I am a son of God, I have not yet been glorified, and I cannot look upon his glorified face. But when that day comes, I will look him full in the face, because I will be like him. The papacy will not. He is a fraud. We should pay him no heed. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.